Did you do that again? <laughs> Here's our little introduction. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Welcome to the David Ed Podcast. Today we have a very special guest. Go ahead, Ed. Bob Wisdom, a distinguished actor who me and Dave both admire his work very yes. much, especially in Thank the Thank you. Podcast. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, Bob, thanks for joining us again. Um, we would love to know about, well, there's so much that we want to discuss regarding acting and like your love of music, etc. But before that, perhaps you could talk about your early days growing up in D.C. and what was that like? And yeah. Yeah, right. well, yeah. you know, D.C. was a little small town then with, uh, it was a big, big city, small town. Uh, you know, we had, we had um, great little neighborhoods all over and, and um, a real blend of people. You know, we had our segregation and all that stuff. Right. And then you had official Washington, which is, you know, the one that everybody sees, the capitals, the big white buildings and, and all of that. And so I grew up in the six I came of age in the sixties and seventies. And that was a time of the civil rights movements and the, the anti war movements and, and all of that. So that was sweeping through the city at the same time. So you had a lot of um of what we now call progressive. Uh, 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 energies around, and um, you know, I remember going down to the to the big march when the what the hippie there were hippies and then the yippies, and the yippies were the ones who were really out in the street, um, and they didn't shy away from from any kind of interaction with police. Wow. So I found myself, you know, covering the story from my journalism class. And I'm standing down there when this sweep of um, of all these people, these yippies, came through the streets down by the Department of Defense, and then right back are coming all of these police with shields and the whole thing. And then there was like it was looked like Game of Thrones, you know, just this big clash. Wow. And I remember stepping into this doorway, watching this, and then seeing, wow, this is this is America today. Right. And later that night. Jimi Hendrix um, showed up impromptu and and played uh, for the all the everybody was on the mall camped out and he played the Star Spangled Banner solo. Oh so, wow! Yeah. You you, yeah. you saw that while you were there? Yeah, yeah, that was that was in '67. Yeah. So what age were you then? Like, may I ask? Sorry. What, okay. what age were you then? What age? I was just in. I was just starting high school. Right. Yeah. Wow. Just starting high school. That's so, but we had a little journalism class, and I always wanted to be a journalist. And mm. you know, in 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 our house, we we kind of everybody read the newspaper and were up on politics. And so, um, so I went down to cover, thinking innocently it would just be I talk to somebody and take some notes, and I watched a piece of history get made. You oh, know, so. that's amazing. And, uh, yeah. and that was a was that a civil rights protest or a Vietnam protest? That was a Vietnam protest. Right. Um, Civil rights protest was the big one for that Martin Luther King um, uh, had on the at the the march on Washington. Uh, my father took us down there, and we we stood, you know, and just with like thousands and thousands of people, and we stood and watched King give give his speech uh, on the mall. It's amazing. And yeah. I, your 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 dad and your mom were Jamaican, right? Uh, yeah. Did you yeah. talk a bit about their influence on you and? how they came to america except well they came they came in the um uh late 40s and uh they came as um they came as domestics to to the states they weren't married at the time they met here right and um uh so they came and worked in different households and then when they got married they worked in the same household my father was a butler my mom was a maid okay. and um and um so I got to see, it was kind of this upstairs, downstairs thing. You know, we got to see, um, you know, this, these big grand houses and all of that in Washington and all these diplomats and all of that. And then we had all the Jamaican, you know, housekeepers because our cousins and our families all worked in these houses. So we would have these little, they would bring us to work and we, you know, uh, we'd be in the back room and they would bring us food downstairs and stuff. And we'd have our own little party while these other things were happening. So this was in the Rockefeller houses and mayors and governor's houses and Washington senators and all that kind of stuff they worked for. 
So, yeah, so that was Washington in the 60s, in the 50s and 60s. So you grew up uh, around a lot of Jamaicans then? Yeah, 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 it's a big, big, big community. Um, Jamaican families would, when they got word somebody was coming up, everybody would get a, you know, make room in a house. That person would get a, a, a room to get set up or, you know, a couple of rooms for their family, um, you know, some money to start up and you know place in a job or help with a car and all that so it was that kind of huge extended kind of thing and 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 then we would have these um the the jamaican community would have like these big parties right right um you know a couple of times a month so my 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 father and his friends and my mom everybody would be cooking 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 and we'd go to these big parties and and you know everyone kind of created their whole life together there. Yeah. Right. Now, that would have been a slightly different culture from the African-American culture, would it have been? Yeah, absolutely. That, yeah. that was totally different. Mm -hmm. um, right. Uh, and, and up until um, five, six years old, seven years old, you know, I was brought up in Jamaican culture. And then after going to school and started starting to kind of... Uh, see what was necessary to 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 survive yeah. you know i started to and my sisters we we started to uh blend into the african community uh, african-american community and there was some overlaps um and it wasn't until we moved to a different part of washington we were we started out in southeast and we moved to northwest and and then we started to to um to to shape our own identities you know which were kind of tricultural. There was uh, the American identity, there's uh, the, the African-American identity, and there's Jamaican identity. So all of these things, we had to learn to speak these different languages to, yeah. to sort of make life happen. Yeah. And uh, you, uh, you ran track in high school? Oh. Yeah, 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 track was my, my sport. Track was, yeah, that was, that, that's been the center of my life and all my friendships and, and uh, uh, everything about my my greatest mentor was my track coach brooks johnson um you know the, one of the biggest influences in my life from um uh, outside my father was uh brooks johnson and and robert burnett was another track coach but all you know i started running when i was 10 10 years old wow. and before that i had like you know real serious asthma and, and after I, I started, you know, running track, it just disappeared. So I think there was kind of some psychosomatic thing that was connected with, uh, with having it, but then it, it, it disappeared. And, and, um, and I really, I found my achievements in, in track and field were um, really paved the way for how I would deal with the world. Um, wow. And we, 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 we learned to train hard, hard, hard. Mm -hmm. And we learned to be, but Brooks inspired us to be the best, best, best. Mm -hmm. So when I decided to do anything, uh, you know, whether it's school or whether it's, you know, career path or what, I knew that I could work hard. I knew that I could outwork anybody. And I had a real competitive fire to, to, to win and to come out ahead. Um, and then, you know, over time, that was sort of tempered with um, uh, compassion and other things, you know, to kind of, but, you know, it, it really helped, um, uh, it really helped motivate me, keep me, and my mother and father, they kept us motivated. Education was really important. Right. So that, that kept us uh, motivated to, to keep, um, uh, just keep our head up, you know, keep our head up. Who would have been like your influences with like regards to literature? What were you kind of reading as a as a young man? Well, um, that was one of the interesting things. Um, uh, my my mom worked for this South African family, um, and uh, so she would bring home books, a lot of English authors, children's books, uh, Enid Blythe, and and all of these folks and. So I read five go hunting and five go fishing and all of these things, you know, and, 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 and then my parents got the first, um, you know, the, the, the salesmen would come through the neighborhoods. Um, some would be selling 
carpets and some would be selling fabrics, a lot of the old Italian families. And then came the encyclopedia salesman. So uh, my family bought um, uh, a set of books called The Childcraft and then um, a set of books called The Encyclopedia. Uh -huh. So I took it on and I read the entire encyclopedia cover to cover, nice. like year after year after year. Wow. And, and my mom would tell me, I would go and read in the bathroom and then I'd put them up on this windowsill. My mom said, go bring those books downstairs and put them on the shelf. Because you know, I would just sit in the bathroom for hours just reading the encyclopedia. And, and, and then it was, then I would get, um, I, I also loved the, the King Arthur legends and all of that kind of stuff, you know, I, and um, uh, Lady of the Lake and, and all of this kind of stuff. So these were all of the sort of fantasy things that started to weave their way into, into you know, my awareness. And then, then when I got to high school, um, I started to read. Uh, I got involved with uh, Black Panther, you know, with their, uh, they were working with the kids and, and um, providing breakfast for the kids. So some of the guys would turn us on to books and, and that sort of thing. Wow. Uh, later on, when I was in high school, uh, Gil Scott Heron, who's a musician, yes, yes. had a club called uh, Diogenes Den. And so I would go there and, and a lot of people would turn me on. So I sort of had this, I was getting turned on as an activist, but wow. then going, you know, my parents put me in this private school. So I had this kind of double life going, <laughs> uh, you so, know. Of, wow. Did you, did you ever join the Black Panthers? Did you ever become No, a no, no, I, I never joined, but, but, um, but that's where I got my, that, that's, that's where I cut my teeth. Right, right. cool. Understanding um, uh, social issues and a sense of politics um, and a sense of, how our governments operate and how we operate and all of that. So there was there was all of that that I took on, and then going to this uh, high school, this prep school, high school, uh, St. Albans. I got a whole other dose of how the how the power Washington power establishment worked. Right. I was going to school with the Kennedys and the Gores and the the wow. Bushes and all of them, so I could see those how those kids were raised and then i saw the kids that that i was connected to from from uh, my neighborhood and growing up so there was a a lot of cooking that was happening you know yeah. at the time um, you you must have done pretty well in high school because you made it to columbia university yeah yeah well you know it, it's um there, there were a bunch of factors um mm -hmm. I think reading encyclopedia helped. <laughs> but but um, yeah. you weren't uh, cheating on your test, were you? <laughs> no, no, I didn't figure that one out. I wish I could have. But but you know, there was just a combination of a lot of things. Um, I didn't want to to take an athletic scholarship because um, I didn't want my education based on whether I ran track or not. Um, so. Uh, we, I had a lot of people who, who helped me, you know, get in schools and helped me apply to schools. And mm -hmm. um, uh, Brooks and my neighbor, Mr. Cox, and a bunch of people, you know, just really um, just raised my, my, my eyes to, to another possibility. Right. And, um, uh, and then I knew at the Ivies, they gave financial assistance based on need rather than um, athletics. So I, I preferred that, and that actually worked because um, as much as I love track, as much as it meant to me, but um, once I got to New York, I started to, I just, I just saw a whole other world. You right, know? sure. And I saw a bunch of other possibilities. I started getting into jazz radio and doing a radio show. I, I got into, you know, the arts, New York art scene, the the literary scene, the, 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 you know, plastic arts and, and music and dance. And my best friend was a great photographer and he taught me a lot. And, and then just, you know, just being in New York, you just absorb stuff, you know? So, um, and, you know, young man's curiosity got a lot, a lot of places to go. So oh, yeah. I, I went into all of them. <laughs> so, yeah, I was checking out, I was checking out my thing too, you know, and then the world of women and women, you know, women changed my life, you know, in lots of ways, you know. So, um, yeah, so so New York was a whole other thing. And, and 
So I wound up taking a year off of track and field. And if I had done that at some other university, I would have lost my, my I would have had to drop out. Right. But, um, but here I could still, you know, I, I you know, it just, it, it was just another broadening of, of my experience. Yeah. Would you say you were seduced by New York? Um, I'd absolutely say that. <laughs> I mean, I'd absolutely say that literally and, and yeah. figuratively, you know, because, um, you know, I remember uh, in high school, I used to go to the um, to the library, and you know they had all the the newspapers from around the country on in the stacks, and I would pull out the Village Voice, right. and I sit there and just wind up going through the Village Voice, mm -hmm. reading all of these writers then, and you know I mean just and it was like this, what is this thing, New York? And when I got there, it was like, fuck, it was dirty, it was nasty, it was intense, yeah. you know? Um, you know, for like six months, I didn't go below 110th Street. I just stayed right up in the Columbia area. Oh. Yeah, because it was like kind of, it was, it was that intimidating. Um, and then, you know, with my friend Danny, who was, who's older than me, but he, he knew everybody in New York and every artist and every painter and every, you know, so we would just go to stuff and go to art openings and go to book parties and book launches and, and music and concerts. And then his best friend was, was Miles Davis, uh, you know, hand drummer. So, oh. you know, I got to see them and, and interact in that world. So just things started opening up. It just, New York blew me away. Um, right. You know, I had, Great experience when um, Sonny Rollins used to listen to my my radio show. Wow! When he was on when he was on uh, his woodshedding phase, so he didn't play for several years, uh -huh. and um, uh, but he would call in and we'd have these conversations on air, you know. And so, you know, and and Sonny is a deep cat, so you know, people like this would just turn you on to to read this, check out that young blood, do this, do that, you know. So. All of my, you know, I was living a Google life, um, you know, back then before Google, you know, people would just say, check this out, check that out, or give me a book. And, you know, I remember seeing, I had a, you know, I mean, you know, I, I remember going in this bookstore across from campus, and I saw this beautiful woman, older woman, the shock of white hair, you know, and it turned out to be Susan Sontag, you know, so. Oh, wow. So, yeah. <laughs> So I, you know, we, we we would we would sit sometimes. She would sit, and you know, we just have little co casual conversations. I had no idea who she was, right? You know, at the time until years later when I was like, "Oh shit, that was Susan," you know. But right. she would turn me on to a lot of things, and she would just go through the stacks. This bookstore called Papyrus, and she would go through the stacks, and you know. And one time she brought me a book. She said, "You might want to have a look at this," you know, and. And it just, you know, it was a book on on civil rights and, and the movement. And um, and it was just, you know, so New York was that. So that was a seduction. It was like every yeah. day you walk up and there was another piece of fruit hanging, you know? Yeah. So, so you graduated from Columbia in, in economics. Is that correct? Well, history and economics. History yeah. and economics. So, so like when you graduated, like, what was the plan? Like, what, what, what ended up happening? Not what was the plan? What ended up happening? I believe you moved well to the plan was to go to law school because right. during college i had i had um i had interned on capitol hill for a couple of years in fact i interned uh on the as an intern on the judiciary committee wow. uh, during the years when when nixon was getting impeached wow. so i went down so i was kind of uh i worked for the washington congressman who got me a, a position, you know, an intern. And that only meant that we would sit, you know, we'd, we'd have to, um, we had to get clearing because we were all going through boxes that were coming back from the White House. So, but they just had us going through real preliminary, just pulling out files and, and moving around and then passing into the senior staff, which was Hillary Clinton was a part of that and a, a bunch of other. And then they would go through and then create the cases and whatnot. But you know, we and then in the after, in the evenings they would have the hearings. So a bunch of us would go down, and we got the chance to just sit in the galleries and, and uh, in the gallery and, and watch the uh, the hearings. Wow. You know, and watch this yeah. this incredible moment. You know, sure. so uh, so politics was something that I was thinking I'd be going into. You know, um, 
go to law and then go into politics and blah, blah, blah. That was kind of it. And then um, it was my senior year that I took my first, the, the, the last semester, I took my first acting course. Ah. And a buddy of mine said, I just needed something to fill out my, my, my schedule. And he said, man, take this thing, man. You, you, you know, you, it's a gut course. You can just jump, out, jump in, jump out. So I, I took it and I was like, you know, we just go in there, we were just fucking up, you know. Right. And and then the professor pulled me aside one day and said, you know, you could be good at this. And I was like, oh man, I just want to get a C and get out of here, you know. Right. And uh, but the bug bit me, you know. So yeah. when I graduated, um, I went to work on Wall Street, but I continued studying acting at the uh, HB Studios down HB. downtown. Yeah. And so I kept that going um, for years. Um, you know, I would just study acting with like everybody at the school, study movement and all. But I was in the closet about it because yeah. I didn't have any contacts. I didn't know how you break into acting. I didn't really have the confidence at that time, you know. Um, but people kept encouraging me. I went on from HB. I went to work with, I uh, went to, um, uh, work with Michael Moriarty, who was a, a, a great New York actor, a great actor, and uh, just kept working with different teachers until one day, you know, they, one of them said, this was years and years later, this was in the, you know, uh, about 80, 83, and one of my teachers said, uh, you know, you're ready to go, you know, and, um, and then, you know, then fate started to show up. Right, yeah. right, yeah. Because am I right that you moved to you moved to London? You ended up moving to England? Or yeah, I I done um uh, I worked for NPR for a number of years. Oh yeah, yes, yes, yeah. yeah. For all, all things considered, and um uh, so I I you know that was my journalism thing and politics thing. I before that, me and a buddy did um uh, we started a film company. After this was after I left the bank, called Four Year Here. Uh, we we priority pictures, and we went on to to try to do a, a series of documentaries, short vignettes on uh, American athletes who who would dwell in obscurity for three, four years, and then every fourth year, Olympic year, they become national heroes. Yeah. So it was called it was called Four Year Heroes, uh -huh. and so we had rowers, we had all these people identified. We had, me and my buddy had raised, you know, like almost $100,000 to like do this project through public tele television at the time, which was the outlet. Right. And, um, and then Jimmy Carter called the, uh, the boycott of the Olympics. And so the bottom fell out of the project. Wow. Okay. So, so you know, I, we were left holding the bag on a bunch of money and unused footage that we had shot and all this and uh i was on the edge of just like falling apart but you know long story short um the woman that we were um connected with at um at at uh, public television called me and said look we have a, a position at our radio station if you want to check it out and so through some you know rigmarole and after a few months i wanted to get in that position that got me into public radio. And then every afternoon I would hear this radio show, All Things Considered. And so I, I called them up and asked if I could be an intern over there. So I wound up interning there and then joining the staff. And so I was in radio for a number of years. Nice. So while I was in radio, I, I really, uh, I focused on a lot of things. Um, you know, I did, um, uh, I, I traveled with uh, Bob Marley and the Whalers. Nice, um, God, wow. And and did a, a little radio documentary about them. Um, I I, uh, I did the first radio piece of Phil Glass. I put that on the air. A lot of stuff, you know. So um, so when when I decided to when NPR went through a big financial crash, I left and then I started uh, being a freelance arts curator. So I I, I curated this um, this. Uh, a three week music festival, myself and a, a couple others in Washington, where we brought all of these experimental musicians from all over and we put them concerts all over the city and 
in arboretums and gardens and in you know political halls, all those kind of places. And so that kind of got me a reputation um, for doing uh, art art events. Mm -hmm. And and then somebody hired me in Madrid, and I went over there and did a a big music festival, did another dance festival, and then uh, I got a call from the ICA in London um, to if I wanted to uh, be artistic director um, in their performing arts program. So I said, yeah. And that was, but that came just at the time of, um, uh, I had just done my first summer theater gig um, as, and that was the summer of uh, 83, 84. And I did, um, uh, uh, we did, I played Nat Turner, who was this, um, who led a slave rebellion. Right. A friend of mine, you know, just out of the blue, said, Bob, I've, I've been writing this play on Nat Turner, and I don't know if you ever thought of doing any acting, but um, here's a uh, wow. script you'd be interested in, in playing him. Mm -hmm. So it was like a gift from heaven. Um, wow. So I, I wound up going down to Lexington, Virginia, playing this role, um, and also that summer doing Midsummer Night's Dream and, and uh, uh, you know, a couple other plays. Yeah. And it was the great summer of my life. And then, you know, uh, some other personal things that were happening. But I, at the end of the summer, I got the call to go to the IC and I went over. And I was just going to stay a week and I wound up staying a month. And mm -hmm. then uh, I moved over there. And so it was the next, the next eight years um, was in London. That yeah. was London. Wow. Just going back to, to Nat Turner, what kind of a character was he? How would you describe him? Nat, Nat Turner was, um, he was fire. Uh, yeah. Yeah. He, he, he was a dreamer yeah. and he yeah. dreamt of freeing the, the slaves through violence. Uh -huh. um, and he didn't shy away from the use of violence uh -huh. and his sword. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he, he didn't have the most well-honed political sense, but he knew how to lead people and get them to, to see the reason for their, uh, uh, the reason they needed to seek their freedom. Yeah, right. and, and, and gave them a taste of, what freedom could be, mm -hmm. um, and so he was a necessary, a necessary person in the history. In order to, to cut the the chains of slavery, you yeah. know, and what and that that people felt, uh, you know, the institution of slavery was rock solid, but he he put the fear in white people that you know its time has had come, right, and and he followed through. You know, so he cut off a lot of heads, you know. And, um, <laughs> cool. Awesome. Was it was it yeah. fulfilling to play him? Was it it was it was I thought it was an incredible thing to play him um as my first time ever being on stage. I, I felt it was a it was a baptism. I felt I had to really go deep in myself to um to connect with the fire mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to be that man. Um, that wasn't easy for me because I didn't take naturally to uh, straight out violence. Right. Uh, um, I always felt there was a way to negotiate and to work things out. You know, I was probably, you know, although I admired Malcolm X, but I was probably um, in between and closer to King. Right. You know, as as uh, as a student of nonviolence, yes. uh, especially at that stage when when I played that, I was probably in my twenties, someplace in my twenties when I played that. Right. But it, it the role the role propelled me into to an honesty with myself. Like, mm -hmm. could I taste blood, yeah. and could I could I say these words out loud, and could I could I feel the passion of those dreams that he had? Right. And so it was a real journey for me. And, and um, it really, 
uh, it, it, it taught me something about, it taught me everything about um, what acting would be for me and, and could be. Could you talk a little bit more about Bob Marley as well? Like, how do you feel about him and how was, you know? Man, <sighs> this cat, man. Uh, yeah, I I went down. You know, there, I, I I when I went, um, Jamaica was in the middle of political discord. Right. And uh, my auntie lived right in the middle of Trenchtown. Wow. Okay. Okay. And I remember one time going down to visit. This was before this documentary. I went down to visit, and um, and all of the people, all the different militias that I had to go through, the gunmen wow. that I had to go through, and everybody knew everybody in the in the ghetto, you know. So I said, "I'm going to see my, I'm back. Well, you know, I'm back from. I'm I'm her nephew. I'm a grand nephew." So, you know, you're, you're from far enough. And they were just dismissing me wow. as a ball head because I was ball head at the time. Wow, right. And, and so, and then one said, let me, let me go see. So they go to, they said, and so when I came to the door, they all came to the door with guns. And she said, Bobby, Bobby, come in. <laughs> we love to see you. And all this and hugged me up and all them guns are, right, you're all right then. And so they, you know, because they were taking care of her, you know, uh, and taking care of the, the older people in the neighborhood. But I saw really what, what had happened to, to live like that, to live with bars on your windows, to live with guns, automatic weapons everywhere, you know. Um, and it was a heartbreaker to, to see this place called Paradise, Jamaica, be locked down like this. Right. So when I went to see, so, um, I proposed to the NPR people I wanted to go down to Jamaica and to um, to see uh, the voice of Jamaica at the time, Bob Marley, as and the backdrop of the uh, of the war between the politicians, uh, you know, Manley and and Santiago. Mm -hmm. And so I go down to Bob's house. I go down to the to the um, uh, his his big house in in Kingston. And everybody, I mean, the yard was just full. Every roster friend was there, boom, boom, boom. So I walk in and I'm all like, I'm all pulled together with like a little, you know, like butt down shirt and some white slacks and all that stuff. You know, I walk in and say, I'd like to do it. I'm from National Public Radio in Washington and I wanted to do an interview with, with Mr. Marley. And they cracked up laughing and they missed me and, you know, but nobody, they didn't take it seriously. Right. So I stayed for hours and I, you know, for like four or five hours. And then, you know, one guy got up and said, who does my, come? you know, I, I, I wasn't smoking herb then. So, you know, they passed me herb and I wasn't smoking herb. And, you know, so finally Bob came out and I said, what body am I? And, and so they said, is it mine? This is Bob lady. You want to take, you want to do an interview with um, radio and all them things, blah, 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 blah. So, is it thrown in? Nice. So, so I went. I wound up going in, and I said, you know, I'm, I'm just. I wanted to do a radio interview over a series of weeks with you, and and um, uh, blah blah blah. And they're cool, you know. Huh. So that was um, that's where the connection was made, and then over time, he was an angel. He was here on a very clear mission right. and you could you could you felt it when you walked in these stadiums and you would see you know 80 90 thousand people and everybody knew every single word to his songs yeah wow. yeah yeah you um, know yeah. and and um you know you see it in in italy you see it in pittsburgh you see it everywhere 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 you know and you see backstage you know the kind of vibes that that his inner circle had you know they were locked in you know to to and when that band when that band's first hit i mean it was like it would just take off 
and it never touched the ground. The music never touched the ground. Bob would just be, and the I trees would be that boom singing, and everybody would just like it was like a it was like the closest to real church that I felt even before any churches I went to. You know, it was like really you felt you felt the the touch of a God there. You know, yeah. Yeah. and 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 um, and it took you hours to come down afterwards. You know, because. Because you you you're, you you literally were turned up, you know, tuned up and turned up, you know. Wow. So he was, he, and he was a man of of wisdom and huge heart, you know. And you think that um, you just wonder why he left so early, you know. Yeah, yeah. But the world wasn't ready for a man with that much vision. He left so much that we're just unpacking now. Of course, you know. yeah. and and uh, he changed the course of music throughout the entire world. Yes, uh, for sure. Yeah, so that was, that was Bob. So when we were doing our research. We, me and Dave, saw that uh, you appeared on a couple of our favorite British TV shows, uh, The Bill, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> The Bill on Poirot. Poirot. Uh, yeah. Did you work opposite <laughs> David? Suchet? Did you work with David? Yeah. I work. Well, I worked with David. I worked with David on on Poirot. <laughs> and then I, I I later worked with them on live from Baghdad. Oh, oh okay. nice! Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Really it, working with him, he's he's quite oh, heavyweight. Yeah. Oh my god! <laughs> that you know, I mean, when you're sitting next to somebody like that, you you just kind of pinch yourself and say, "Wow, I've made it," <laughs> you know? Because <laughs> yeah. I mean, uh, and we had a great time. We actually shot together in in um, in uh, Morocco because we shot some some scenes there. Nice. Yeah. To hang out, you know, for nights in the bar. And, I mean, he's a great storyteller. When I worked with him on Poirot, um, you know, it was all formality. You know, I kind of just went in and okay. literally I just did like one scene and, you know. Right. But, um, uh, but the bill, <laughs> yeah, the, bill was, was, <laughs> the bill was a trip. The Who did you play? Who did you I, play? Played this, I played this, uh, this Nigerian uh, hustler, street hustler, um, and and if I can come across, I'm, I think I have it. If I come across the uh, uh, the footage, I'll send it to you. Um, I'm just running this con on the street, you know, with this night, and they let me keep my dreads in, and it was just, it was hilarious, you know. <laughs> but yeah, you know what it is. You know the English shows, you know. Yeah, we do. <laughs> Coronation Street. You know, yeah. all of these things, these long running, forever, forever running shows, you know. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Cool. Uh, so were you like playing music then as well? Like when did you start? Like, because you played the drums, right? Were you? Well, I, I, I played the drums from back in, you know, when I was hanging out in D.C. Oh, you always uh, have, yeah. The Panthers, yeah. You know, we, you know, we'd be in the park and we'd be hitting strong. Right. And then over the years, you know, the other side of my life was um, a spiritual path that, that I initiated that um, I would play a lot of Cuban drums, Brazilian oh. rhythms, and all of that. So the drums have always just been there. Um, it wasn't until the '90s that I took on uh, uh, the Moroccan culture and right. started playing um, uh, the Moroccan music. Uh, is it is it called uh, Nawa Ganawa? Ganawa, exactly. Ganawa. 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 Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, man, y'all did some research, man. Damn. Yeah, yeah, we are yeah. serious. <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't wait to talk to you. Yeah, we're excited. Um, um, and you went on a tour of, uh, uh, you had a little theater tour in Britain too? Yeah. Like you went yeah, went well, I, 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 yeah, that was uh, when I started, when I left the ICA, um, then I started working full time as an actor. And right. so, you know, you just work regional theaters around the country. Right. And, um, you know, so I worked. It was easy to get work. You got work immediately, like as an actor, immediately. I got work. Well, I got work. Another, another, you know, serendipity. Um, I, uh, I put out that that uh, to a fellow artistic director guy, and um, I said, you know what? I'd, I'd like to get back into acting, but I don't want to put myself on my my own stage, you know. So. Um, so it turns out two weeks later, he was talking with um, uh, some people at the Bush Theater. And, oh, nice. And, yeah. yeah, and uh, they were putting on a play and they needed an American actor. So they said, he said, why don't you call Bob Wisdom? He's, he says you want to get into acting. So, um, so 
they called me and asked me to audition. I had a really small but a fantastic staff. So I told Lois and Tam, I said, you know, I'm going to go for this audition and, and I don't know what's going to happen. But well, I got the part and we reorganized the office so that I could rehearse over there during the day and then open shows at night and they would run things during the day and then, you know, have off at night. So, so I wound up getting this role um, uh, at the Bush and out of that I got, uh, it was called Millfire and uh, American writer did it. And um, I got, uh, I got an agent and I got in the, in British equity. And so um, it was maybe about another eight, nine months later, I decided I'd leave the ICA mm -hmm. and, um, and go seek a life in acting. So I started to go up for shows, you know, the agent would put me up and I wound up getting, um, I got, I was in one of the early companies of a, a play at the Royal Court called um, Our Country's Good. Oh, wow. And yeah, and and then that toured around the country, right. and uh, so that got me in the whole network of sleeping and digs, and that's where I paid my dues. You know, that's where I, I did my thing. You know, that's amazing. And uh, in 1993, you uh, you flew into Hollywood. Now you moved. To, tell us about the move to Hollywood. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, it was actually a move back to um, oh. to Washington. My my oh, father okay. was last stages. Oh, and, okay. And I came home to help my mom mm -hmm. uh, because she had brought him home from the nursing home. And so I came back and um, and then I, I went to work for a bookstore in Washington and I'm just not good at working a regular job, you know, so that lasted a couple of days and, you know, it was like moving like big crates of boxes and books and I was like not into it. So um, we hear it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, uh, a friend of mine, the the opera director Peter Sellers, not the actor, but the other right. Peter Sellers, right, yeah. called me. Um, called me from. Uh, he was doing the uh, the L.A. Arts Festival, which was this huge, sprawling Olympic Arts Festival, and he was doing that, and so he asked me to come and put the music program together. And I was like, no, nah, I'm not doing just acting right now. You know, I said, no, 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 come on over. Let's talk. So I, I went out and um, and my mom said, you know, you go with my blessing. So um, I went out there. Well, actually, I was going to go back to England. And it was the first time my mom uh, turned me and said, you know, she started crying. And she just said, I don't want all that water between us, you know. I'd rather you have land between us, you know. So wow. so that that kind of changed my thinking. So I was I had all this life set up in England that I kind of just left. Okay. And um and and then I called I took the position with Peter and I got a chance to learn LA. I, I went in there with a with a gig and um literally it was two weeks after landing there, that through a wrong number, I got my first movie part. Wow! So, yeah. Which, so it was, which was was it uh, opposite Dana Carvey? Yeah, clean slate. Dana, Dana, Dana Carvey. Dana exactly. Carvey. What was Dana like? What a comedian! What an interesting guy. <laughs> yeah, he's a he's a great guy. This was a vehicle for him yeah. to kind of um, uh, you know they just put a whole bunch of actors around him. Michael Gabon, all kinds of people. <laughs> <were> like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Everybody was. was, was, was it? Know, <laughs> that's it, that's it, that's it. That <laughs> so, so I played this blind musician, which was absolutely, you know, perfect. And um, and uh, and so, you know, through that, I got uh, an agent, I got a manager, and nice. you know, started working. Boom. Nice. What, what were your first impressions of Hollywood? Like, what did you think of the vibe and people? Well. Um, you know, I had, I had, with all the other experiences that I had, you know, living abroad, working abroad, traveling all through Europe and Africa for years, um, and uh, I wasn't really phased. When I, when I wound up in, in, um, in L.A., 
I was, I think, 39, 38, 39. So it wasn't like coming out, I was 21, right, you right. know, yeah, right. and nobody was going to look at me like, you know, the, you know, like the, the beach boy, you know, surfer dude kind of, you know, I, I was a grown man with some experience and I'd already had a couple of careers, you know, so, yeah. so I was just, I, I looked at it as, um, I was on a mission, you know, to, to break in. And what was clear to me was I didn't want to be, um, I never want to be a movie star. Okay. You know, um, I wanted to be a car an actor who could do a lot of different things uh, and uh, have a life, yeah. you know. And uh, and I had I had to figure out how to bring those two pieces, keep those two pieces in my view all the time. Um, so I wound up getting you know a, a good manager and a and a good agent who actually were were I learned a lot through. Um, I learned the business, but I didn't go into it wide eye. I didn't call my my agent every day and beg for jobs, and, you know that sort of thing. I was just like you know we had a pretty mature relationship. Uh, my manager, he and I've been together now thirty years, and um, it's he's like my my brother, right. you know. Um, we were family. So and yeah, it sounds like you went in there patient with patience as well. You had lots of patience and. You know, I, I'm playing yeah. a long game. Yeah, the long game. Long I love it. Yeah, yeah. Nice. yeah. yeah. You know, because because um, so I didn't look for, you know. Now that doesn't mean I didn't hit rock bottom a bunch of times. You know, so there were days when I went broke. You know, and didn't work for a while. Or, but then things would always come. I always had them there. I knew that they were, they were solid. Um, uh, my my agent at the time would say. Um, Look, it's just it's a numbers game, you know, and you just gotta hang in there till your number gets gets called. And he's right, you know. I mean, every phase, every seven to ten year phase, you get another level of of acceptance by a set of casting graduates. You have to go out and introduce yourself to new people all the time, but um, your reputation, quote unquote, precedes you. So people. And then I've been involved in good shows over the years, so those also paved the way and blah, 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 blah. So yeah. it's, it's the long game, you know. Yeah. Um, but at the time, I didn't know that, but I just, they knew that. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I just knew, don't fuck it up. Don't get in your own way, right. you know. Um, and, um, you know, at one point, I, I, um, I, I didn't have many dough. I went down and cashed out all my pennies at the Rouse, and um, uh, I wound up taking a, a gig as selling cigars at a cigar shop, you know. And then it was uh, three, four weeks of doing that. And my my agent called and said, "What are you doing?" I said, "Yeah, I said I'm at the good, you know, cigar shop." So he, you know, next thing you know, he drives his car over. He says, uh, "You feel like quitting your job today? You just got four four project offers, you know." Nice. So yeah. wow. then I saw, oh, this is how this place works, you know. Interesting. So you know, out of those four, I could only take two, but it was like I'm happy, you know, and and you know, it was like I knew my level of happiness. I knew what I needed, you know. I still live in the same flat I lived in, you know, when I first moved out here. Um, I, I I didn't go off, you know, with the big payday and go buy a big house up in the hills, mm -hmm. you know. I I kind of I already knew how I wanted to live in the world and I just want to do what I what I love right. and um, and support my my family doing what I love but it's never been about you know all the all of the Hollywood show stuff I've watched it and I've seen it and you get tempted sometimes you know but um, it's it's never enough to kind of say um, uh, let me mortgage my life my life right. or life you know so you didn't sell your soul to Satan. Satan came. Yes. <laughs> Wait, you said, said Satan came? <laughs> Satan came. I, I fucked his daughter. <laughs> Good. <Nice. laughs> That's hilarious. Wow.
So, and you were in Face Off. Did face Off, ever, yeah. Did you have a scene with Travolta or, or, Cage. or Cage? Oh, yeah, yeah, uh -huh. yeah. No, Face Off was the, that was the first big one. Um, 96, that, we think. Yeah. yeah, 97, 96, yeah, I think you shot in yeah. yeah, I remember, you know, going, you know, getting that role and it was like, that was everything to me. That was like, yeah. and to, even to this day, I mean, I'm, I, I just thought about it the other day. Because when I first met John Wu, um, you know, he walked up and he said, uh, "You know, you know, character. I, <laughs> I know action. We make movie. That was his whole direction." <laughs> wow, I like and, it. And Simple. <laughs> so yeah. The whole time, like, you know, I'm like, you know, because you go in thinking, "Oh, you're gonna get directed." And it's like, no, nah, man. It's like just, just go be you. Simple. And awesome. you know, I watched I watched Travolta be him. You know that he was at the top of his game at that time. At that point, right? Um, uh, there were tons of great actors in that movie. Yeah. Um, just a really great cast, and it was a great one. Yeah. You you also did uh, that thing you do with Tom Hanks. Is that right? You were in that. Yeah. Yeah. How was Hanks? Hanks directed that, right? Yeah. He directed that, and and he and and Gary wrote it. Um, it's you know. Who we've seen that guy to be, that's who that guy is. You oh, know, wow. I mean, he, he is. I mean, and and I don't think that there's not a bad bone in his body. Wow. Um, he's a big time professional. He's like from the mainstream school of of you know the Hollywood thing. You know, sure. it tells you. Spielberg, he's in that that world. Yeah, they tell the good wholesome stories, and um, and it was great to be a part of this, you know, and 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 uh, I, I had to learn to play drum. Oh, oh, so, nice. um, you know, so yeah, so I crashed on playing and learned a drum kit. So so it was a, you know it was a great experience, and and then we moved on. You know? Yeah, right. Speaking of Tom Hanks and uh, Spielberg, um, there's an elite class in Hollywood, you know, like. The DiCaprios, the Brad Pitts, do they just hang out together? Do they hang out with any like? Brother, if you find out, you tell me. Okay. <laughs> right. I, 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 okay. Uh, you know, I, I really am on the very edges. Okay. Um, right. couple edges away from that world. Sure. Um, I don't really, you know, I've gone to parties and I've seen them and I, you know, that's so, but I, I've never been a party person, mm -hmm. so I didn't work Hollywood. Right. you know that way i just kind of take the jobs i do go do the job and i love the cameramen i love the gaffers i love you know the the hair and makeup ladies and the guys and you know that's where my my connections are and i love being on set i learn a lot about you know how to shoot and lenses and you know structuring story so that's my whole thing the rest of it doesn't even face oh, you know. yeah. you're in it for the act for the you know the love the, the real thing I'm, I'm, in it, I'm in it for for the the joy of doing it you know right. and and you know the the that's why the the consummate uh job was um because the people at the wire felt the same way you know they 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 were as non-hollywood as you could get and right. uh, you know working in baltimore so yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I think now we can get on to that finally this moment yeah. that many yeah. of our listeners will be ready <laughs> yes. for. So as legend has it, you originally auditioned for Stringer Bell. Could you tell us about that? Um, yeah. yeah, fuck man, you read them all. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Idris did a great yeah, job. Yeah. I'm imagining you yeah. now. I'm imagine I, yeah. was, I was, Dude, I was driving were, up and down your street last week. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> We've talked your call. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, he, he did all right job. He's okay. Yeah. You know. But uh, uh, no, I, I was in the room with uh, Wendell Pierce and a couple other guys were all auditioning yeah. for Springer Bell. And then when I didn't get it, I was like, fuck this show. You know. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah. So, so actually, for the, the first about the first five episodes, I was like, "Fuck it, I ain't gonna watch it." And then one day, I I caught up, and um, I was a big fan after that, you know. But I didn't see it coming, you know. I I walked away, but it was uh, I was doing the Ray Charles movie with 
Jamie. Jim oh, Bob. yes. You played yeah. great Jack Lauderdale, the great Jack, Jack Lauderdale. Yeah. yeah, great. What a what a historical figure. The record and company record, founder. Yeah. Right? Which, yeah. Um, yeah. I forget the name of the record company now, but he's a genius. Yeah. 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 He was on the shit, you know, and, yes. and he was, and he and he he made Ray who Ray could be, you know. Right. Uh, yeah. But um, and and so we're down in in uh, New Orleans shooting and. We get the call that uh, they want to offer you a role on the wire. Wow! And oh, so it was like a straight offer. You didn't have to audition for it. No, they didn't have to audition. Right. No, because well, they knew me from right. when they did the corner, and right. they had offered me a job on the corner, and um, uh, I also got this other movie at the same time, Dancing in the Blue Iguana, which was an interesting project because we were improvising the whole movie. Um, so I said, well, let me let me do that, um, which I probably should have done, you know, the corner. Right. But um, David and and everybody remember me from that. So when um, when Bunny came, they just made the straight offer. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. I, I remember there was Swing Time Records for our listeners and viewers. Swing Time, Swing time. Swing time Records. <laughs> but uh, so like when you were working on the wire, when you started working on the wire, did you like immediately think, wow, like oh my God, I'm in the best show ever made. Was there, did you ever have any sense of we that? Just, we just, we, I, I knew I was part of, it was, we, I just loved everybody we worked with, but we didn't, we knew we were doing something good. Something good, yeah. But we didn't, we, nobody, nobody got off on, on where it climbed to and it's right. legendary. It's that. So, right. Yeah, that, yeah. That's, that's what, um, you know, writers and critics do, but, Yes. We, we just knew that we were doing something um, uh, that we just loved doing. Yeah. And the, the writing was off the charts. Yes. And um, the oh. writers themselves were off the charts. The actors were probably, I, I always felt pound for pound, we were some of the, it was some of the greatest set of writers around. Um, yeah. I mean, actors. And that was right up against Sopranos, you know. Well, some some people say it's the best TV show ever made. Yeah. And and but I also found it was a TV show with very little ego. Yes. In it. Yeah. Which well, means. that that goes back to that um, um, that thing of of the kind of workman uh, atmosphere that was around the show, and that it worked. We worked entirely outside of Hollywood. Yeah. So no studio executives are coming polishing scripts and giving their idea. No endless notes, all of that. It was like they, it was David's domain, oh. David and and Ed Burns and and you know that crew, and they made this show, uh, the show that they wanted to make. Right. And um, that's why, that's why it it, it lives where it does. Uh, were David and Ed very collaborative with you guys, with the actors on oh. the character developments? Yeah. Not so much on the character. They knew the characters, but they, they let us. They, Story you know, as they say in in in, in uh, a lot of a lot of folks say it's all about casting. Yes. They cast. They cast well. Yes, they did. Yeah, for you sure. You know, they cast well, and and the casting director is one of the motherfucking best. You know, yes. so um, she she had an eye. She pulled in the right people. And then boom, they could do what they had to do, you know. And uh, when you talk to some of the guys, and, or or ladies, anybody on the show, and who had the conversation, our conversations would be about um, books, life, you know, just who we were, who who we were living ourselves into being. But not a whole lot of stuff on, you know, do this very very. But there was no improvising on that show, not one word was ever improvised. Interesting. So everybody was performing, you know, uh, they were performing to their characters. So that's one of the things I'm very proud of because, you know, the reason we didn't get um, nominations and all that kind of stuff, uh, because there were a lot of old timers who felt that, you know, it was just a bunch of people improvising. Mm -hmm. There was no acting in it. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you know, there was, there was that, you know. <laughs> The majority of the cast were, were black or African-American um, and it never seemed like the show was uh, consciously black. 
you know, like it, well, the, 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 exactly. Well, the, that's yeah. the thing. It was America. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 It was. It was an American experience that just happened to, uh, um, to rest in in black circumstance. Yeah. But you know, but you know, when you see seamlessly going from year one into year two, where you had that whole life of, you know, Greek and and Italian dock workers, and yes. these, you know, these co then you see what Baltimore really. Right. Really, well, so yeah, it was Baltimore was the character was the main character, you right. know, and and um, so so it never became a and other shows have tried it, but every every other show I think makes a mistake of well not a mistake but you know they miss it because they do try to to tell a singular black story, right? Yeah, and yeah. and um, there are places for that, and and they win you know um right. for instance but but the wire wasn't that the wire is very universal really yeah you know? well I, it's, I, it's about class as well yeah. more than anything else you know exactly well, i feel like a lot of let's say you have a, a black movie it's just marketed that way right yeah yeah it's it's madison avenue almost kind of. <laughs> well well that's that's the thing you know it's like we we aren't very again it comes down to how how um how broad our education is. You get a lot of marketing people and they have no experience of, of a non-black black, right. you know, um, or, or, or culture or, and class. They don't understand marketing something through class that would never be done, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, so, so these are the kinds of things that um, the, you know, the wire and all the people attached to it they managed to do without drawing attention to themselves, you know, because if they had to go through, uh, you know, the Hollywood sausage making machine, then we would have just been eaten up and turned into some, some other cop show. Yeah. You know. Right. right. Yeah. So let's maybe talk a bit about like Howard Bunny Colvin's journey. I'm like, you know, for me, he's like one of the moral compasses of the show. Like he's a fundamentally good man. And he's trying to do good things, but he's coming up against a lot of bureaucratic bullshit and resistance, et cetera. Like, it feels like how you, you played that role so beautifully, Bob, it felt very natural how you were doing it. And I'm wondering, like, when you auditioned for Stringer Bell, I assume they got to know you. It wasn't just like, come in and read the sides. They kind of like, like, did they get to know you personally and think, oh my God, this guy would be perfect for this role because of his personality or... Is my question, do you know what I mean? I, I, I know what you mean, and I really have no idea. Um, they they knew me well enough from, because we had the, the audition for the corner was pretty grueling. Um, so they had a sense of, of that, but I'll flip that question because they knew what they were looking for. Right, right. And, and um, they knew all of us, so it never became, we def no nobody definitely took it personally. I mean, I did a little bit, you know, but nobody really took it personally that they didn't get that role because, because you knew they knew what they were what they were going for. Right. And did did you did you do research yourself? Did you talk to cops or did you hang out with people? In well, once I got the part, uh, yeah. When I got Bunny, then they they um, then I wound up spending a lot of time with the Baltimore cops. Mm -hmm. a lot of time mm -hmm. and they got to know me they got to trust me and I could just like absorb absorb that life you know um and that we were living there and I could just get in my car and drive around right. you know and we went to you know these social events that that they would have and you know just just cops and undercover guys and you know they 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 test you and and then you know they and finally, they take you under the wing, you know, and and um, and and you tell that story, you know. So, at a point, the the guy got in my own belly, right? The bunny, you know, um, not even it wasn't even bunny; it was just a cop, right. you know. I was I was just a cop, and 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 then uh, then layers of other stuff started coming on. But you know that that 
Bunny was just supposed to last a year. You know? Oh, really? Yeah, oh. he was just supposed to last a year, and then, and then it was, you know, uh, some executive decision that David and those guys made that brought him back. For how? How would, that's very interesting. I'm just curious. How was he supposed to end? Like, what was the arc of that one year initially? Like, it was just. When Amsterdam folded, that that shot. Oh, right. right. The, yeah, that was right. And then, yeah. of course. Yeah, boom, he's gone, you know. That was such a cool storyline. Maybe you could speak a bit about that, the Amsterdam thing of, like, when you were reading it, like, wow, what are, to get my... Well, you didn't read it. You know, you only got one script at a time. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Right. So so we, we only got one script. So you only saw, you didn't even know it was coming. Right. You know, when I, when I started... Uh, the character got introduced the end of year two. And so I'm looking at the script and I'm seeing them in a whole bunch of scenes, but there are very few words. And so when I look back at it now, uh, the whole architecture of Bunny's arc was in those silent scenes. Yes. Just how, just how he looked at the world around him just what he saw going on, a little boy getting shot by a stray bullet, yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, just all of that. And, 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 you know, how do you leave a mark? How do you, how do you change this? How do you affect this? You know, or do you just go through and, and play, play the game and rank out the numbers and our numbers are going down and just play that kind of bullshit? Or do you actually try to do something with this, with people's lives right. and so yeah so that's what buddy was trying to do and and yeah. you know i go drinking at the time i go drinking in places you know all kinds of neighborhoods you know so i could hear how people talk i could hear how they lived um you know you have that's the best best thing an actor can ever do is yeah. is to just go and hang out you know because um yeah if and that's what I always felt, you know, my great idols would all do, you know, is just to go hang out. And, right. um, well, you know. Baltimore is a great town to, to hang out and go drinking. A lot of great bars oh, in Baltimore. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and, and the bars live. I mean, yeah. you know, they're not just fucking tourist bars. These are like, these are like outposts for the neighborhood, you know. Yeah. So... You have to be very selective on like when you go in them, you know, because they didn't take to outsiders that much. But but if you go in and you you kind of play low under the radar, then you you, yeah. you learn a lot, you know. There were cop bars and the cops would take me into bars that they could go into and that was always, you know, drinking with cops was like it was huge, you know. Sure. Yeah. It's yeah. huge. Well, it's like the bunny thing, cause just going back to the conversation we were having earlier, I, I was saying to Dave before we came on, like I see the bunny thing as like a metaphor for the world in a way of like trying to get things done with it. Like you talked about trying to get things done within the system and like we should work out inside the system and outside the system. And like with the bunny character, it seemed as if like trying to get things done within the system was like difficult. Obviously, he came up against a lot of resistance. So it's interesting. Like, I guess, what's my question here? It's just like, what are your thoughts on that? Of like, um, you know, uh, trying to get, get regarding the bunny, trying to get things done within the system. And well, you know, it, it, what he saw was, I'm in my 29th year. Don't rock the boat. Right. right. Yeah. I mean, just kind of slide out here, get your pension, which is not up with your of life. Course. Yeah. It's but then there's the, when you see. You can ride out with your pension, but there are people who are dying every day because mm -hmm. you haven't fixed anything. Right. You rode, you rode around, you, you, you enforced quote unquote laws and nothing was fixed. Right. You know, you go to these meetings with the, with the, you know, senior level folks and they're not interested in what's happening on the street at all. It's just a game of graphs and numbers, yeah. you know, and then you just, you sit there and say, I mean, and we don't, you know, you can't, you, we all have these moments when the real question pops up and it's, you just say, I can't pay attention. Let me just get my check and get out. Right. Or 
you step into it and you have no idea what you just stepped into. Right. So he stepped into trying to save an old woman whose, whose home was caught in this mess. Mm -hmm. He got caught trying to take care of, you know, these kids in a, in a world mm -hmm. that's gone, to, that's, that could give a shit. Mm -hmm. Right. We're in a, and, and if we're seeing anything, we're seeing it even more now. So there are reformers, quote unquote, whistleblowers. There are reformers. There are people who, who want to save some lives. Yes. Simple yeah. as that. Mm -hmm. Give people a fighting chance. Like, yeah, I feel like on the wire, um, McNulty and Bunny Colvin were real police, you know, and like, uh, other characters joke that McNulty was real. He's real police. He's he's natural police. And I feel like Bunny Coven was also real police, yeah. natural police. And but that was also their undoing. You know, they cared too much almost. It, it's it's that, and and that's a war. You know, that's one of these things that comes up in in popular culture is that um, you can't care too much. Right. You know, um, right. you know, and 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 we hear this over and over. And and I and actually, you know, I see it come up right now at this stage of my life where I I, I say, you know, will me and a handful of people be able to change this world? Right. It, you know, it, or, yeah. Or do we just or do we just like get where we can and kind of go go to a beach in Portugal someplace and right. you know, sip the well, some people would say it's like waving a sword at a tsunami. Exactly. What? Exactly. Yeah, I, I love the book. <laughs> nice. Prison Break, you played a, a guy called Lechero. Oh, Prison Break, yes. Yeah. Which we found out means... Milkman. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, the backstory of that character is amazing. Yeah. 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 Um, no, that, that, was, that, was another, that was another great experience, you yeah. know. Was that fun making a show like that? Was it a lot of fun, physical? Fun. I, I had that kind of show, and and that was such a tremendous character um, yeah. to get to play, and I just I knew I fell in love with the character. Um, I had just come out of a uh, hospital, and oh, wow. I was yeah I was paralyzed for the eight months prior to that. So I just began learning to walk wow. when when you know, I got this call and um, and I remember reading that first scene where he's doing yoga in his in his in his bedroom yeah. and uh, and it was like such a flipping contrast, you know, that I just said I love this guy. And and so when I went in for the audition, I hid my cane and summoned up every ounce of strength and i it it just that room just trans something transformed the heat transformed the the character came out and by the time i i got out and walked down in my car my my manager called me and said they just offered you to park you know oh, yeah. that's powerful yeah 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 so i love i love that character he was part of my healing yeah big mm -hmm. time well, and um, you also worked on The Dark Knight Rises with Christopher Nolan, yeah, right? Yeah, and, and he was another one. I I loved him. He had, he was during that period just before on the um, on the uh, The Dark Knight. Uh, he had auditioned me for that, and but I had just come out the hospital, so I was so I didn't get that role. And then Dark Knight Rises, he knew this was his last one, uh -huh. so he hired all his his actor buddies that he didn't get a chance to work with and everybody showed up in that. And so we just had, it was just great. It was just, yeah. you know, to be on a, on a Christopher Noonan strip set, yeah. you know, which is like, literally like a small city, you know, like a very, and, and, and just massive, you yeah. know. I'd say he got a pretty decent budget for that one. Yeah, I think he had some shekels, you know. He, he, uh, yeah. he, he, <laughs> he had a few. You were, were you eating? You were eating well on on that show. On oh yeah, they, 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 yeah, they. I mean, on those big shows, 
<laughs> they have like they yeah. have the caterers of life, you know. Right. So so like anything you want, they set up for you. It's yeah, it's a trip. Yeah. I love it. That's hilarious. And do you want to talk about that? We yeah, we, we're really curious about what it was like, what it is like to work with the Rock, Dwayne the Rock, John Ballers. <laughs> love you. Yeah. another guy. I love him. I love that show. I love that show so much. <laughs> yeah, it's. I, and all of us had a ball in our little universe. All of us did, but I love, you know, uh, John David Washington. I love Carl nice. McDowell. I mean, it's just, you know, this was family. Mm -hmm. And The Rock set a huge bar because he was so regular that oh. you didn't get any bullshit drama from anybody else. It was a really great beautifully moving set you know everybody worked together well it was just we had a ball and we told it you know i, I think the show got better and better better every single year and um and i miss it yeah i miss balls yeah yeah it's a, it's a very popular show um um yeah i mean the rock is talk about him a little bit more like um how he must be a, a, an incredible person because like he kind of came up the hard way yeah, as well. Wrestling and all. Well, that. he came up the hard way, but yeah. I mean, the thing is, he cracked the code on on Hollywood. Yeah. You know, I mean, to be a nice guy and to be hugely successful never happens. Right. Wow. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, he remained sincerely a nice guy. So, um, you know, he had great whatever the hard knocks he might have had. He had great parenting. He had, he has great character, and um, and anything he has, he deserves. He works hard. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Guy never stops working. Yeah. You know. So talk about talk about somebody who knows how to work hard. He works hard, mm -hmm. and he wanted what he he got exactly what he wanted. He wanted that kind of um, that kind of status in in this business, and he did it. You know. Yeah. So I'm very very, very proud to work with him. Mm -hmm. Very proud. Well, I, I, I guess wrapping up, um, is there anything else you want to work on that you haven't worked on thus far in your career? Great question. Yeah. Well, well, I, I, um, I, uh, the Alienist is coming out and, right. you know, that is what it is. TNT, is that TNT? Good, that's on TNT. Cool, yeah. cool. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a big event uh, project. But I'm also on um, uh, a show. A Mar I'm a Marvel superhero. Oh, nice! In, in a new Marvel series called Hellstrom, okay. that will be out sometime in the fall, and uh, that's another great, great cast. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a it, it's a show I'd never the type of show I'd never done before, which is just straight up horror. Um, it's a it's a horror show, so. Would that be on network TV or Netflix or? That's going to be on Hulu. Hulu, okay, cool. Cool. Yeah, we look out for that. And All right, what, cool. what's the name of your superhero? Caretaker. Caretaker, nice, nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so you were the milkman before, now you're the caretaker. <laughs> Can let, just one, yes, la one, last, one last cliche question, but I think yeah. you're a great man to ask this question of. Impart some wisdom, pardon the pun. Yeah. Could you? Could you give some words of advice to any young actors on acting, on life, auditioning, yeah. anything? Well, like you know, well, you you put the you you said the word earlier is patience. You know, yeah. this the whole thing, and and you know, I have my own views, and I I don't, I don't try to steer anyone into a way of thinking, but mm -hmm. you know, look at why you want to do this. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, do you love acting or do you love being famous? You know, um, the two different things. And I really think, hold on to your soul. Hold on to the things that you care about. Find the things you care about before you get in this because there are a lot of people who will tell you what to care about, mm -hmm. you know, and they'll tell you who you should be to be, to, to get the care you need. And then they leave you high and dry. You know, so you have to walk in with all your good stuff and know that. And then the rest is the rest is a party. 
Yeah. You know, but um, uh, you know, know your talent, trust your talent, don't ever doubt yourself. The people you came in with are going to be your, you know, those are your friends. Mm -hmm. Everybody else is just people you meet along the way. Yeah. You know, and that's 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 yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Bob, thank you for your time yes. and, and for your hey. Yes. Pun intended. Yes. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate Thanks for coming, man. All right. No problem. Thank you. Have again. a great day. When, 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 when is this going to broadcast? Well, we, we might upload it straight away. We'll send it to you before we do. You yeah. know, we'll send tonight. you the link. Yeah. Tonight. We're going to put okay. it up tonight. Put it up. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Let me know. Thanks, Bob. Thank you, sir. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye, man.